future is already here. Houses built in hours from ceramics, a robot brain, even the scientists don't know what it's doing, and a Japanese supermarket where robots do the walking. Is BC missing the boat? Tonight, Vancouver's Doctor Tomorrow, Frank Ogden, peers into the future. But first, Little Sister's Book and Art Emporium is at the center of a familiar storm. Are its books obscene? Do they deserve to be seized by customs? Or are its homosexual clients the target of a new wave of censorship? Tonight, John Dixon, president of the BC Civil Liberties Association, and Jim Diva, co-owner of Little Sisters Bookstore. Sitting in for Jack Webster, Iona Campanolo. And welcome to the Webster Show. Ted Rutledge has gone out and got us an update on the Little Sisters Book and Art Emporium seizure by Canada Customs. The recent amendments to Canada Customs guidelines means that articles dealing with the prevention of AIDS will be allowed through customs. But the BC Civil Liberties Association and the owners of Little Sisters Bookstore say it's too little, too late. The bookstore is currently at odds with Canada Customs, who have been holding a shipment of their books since before Christmas. The bookstore owners say the recent change still won't help them, saying most of the material being held is erotica, while Canada Customs is awaiting a ruling on whether or not the material is obscene. In the past, uh, references to uh, anal intercourse in material that we've uh, detained uh, at the border points uh, have been uh, withheld for classification uh, and were subject to appeal. Uh, because of the concern about uh, AIDS and other communicable diseases, uh, we've now uh, clarified uh, our position somewhat in saying that uh, if uh, an article or materials referred uh, deals with uh, AIDS or other social diseases and aims to minimize uh, uh, the extent of them or protect the public uh, against them, then we will uh, not prohibit its entry into the country. Canada Customs says some of the material presently under contention includes copies of the same books prohibited last year. Unless the material falls under the new guidelines regarding the prevention of communicable diseases, it's not likely they'll ever be released. Jim Diva from Little Sisters Bookshop, welcome to the show. And John Dixon from the BC Civil Liberties Association, not union. Canada Customs adjusted its rules on Monday. Why isn't that good enough for you? Well, why take it now through the courts? <clears throat> well, it is good, and it's nice to see that somebody's alive and well down at damage control at Customs. But uh, I think they're going to need more watertight compartments that are, afford than are going to be afforded them by that relaxation of their guidelines. I think you probably understand that there are something like 58 separate titles that have been seized by customs, uh, many of them literary. Uh, all of them, as far as my association is concerned, uh, just simply not appropriately prohibited by Canada Customs. And are you doing this to test the temper of the times regarding what is the obscenity and uh, pornographic uh, rule of the, of the day? What's the community standard now? Is that why you're making this move? No, there's a couple of questions we want to address, maybe <coughs> three. First of all, uh, we feel that the custom guidelines discriminate against homosexuals. That's one matter. I think that's the soft pitch for us to handle. Uh, the other matter is, do the customs guidelines reflect the direction offered us by the judiciary in this country? Uh, our uh, counsel in this matter, Derek Corrigan, has discovered today, wading through this uh, turgid Customs Act, that customs is bound to follow judicial precedent in establishing its guidelines. There is no uh, judicial precedent that ought to give direction to customs in this matter. That is, there is no judicial precedent that ought to lead customs to prohibit references, depictions, descriptions of anal intercourse. Uh, that's the medium pitch. The toughest pitch is what we think of the obscenity laws uh, in general. And I guess uh, the problem there for us is that we don't quite understand why it is that descriptions of sexuality have to provide some excuse for uh, their publication in our community. That is, why do we have to apply a community standard to... Well, what to are some of the literary titles uh, that you're talking about? 
well. There's uh, poetry by Allen Ginsberg. Uh, there's some stuff from Jean Genet. Uh, yeah. There's some Ackerman. Uh, that Canada should have to protect itself from the productions of the mind of Allen Ginsberg in 1986 is a kind of bizarre disgrace. Well, is this something to do with your bookstore then? Do you think it's homophobic? We, we definitely think it's homophobic. No other bookstore in Vancouver in Western Canada has the type of surveillance that we have by Customs Canada. Every time a book shipment comes in, I mean, the bells ring, and they all come down and they all look at it. It's delayed for several days at best. Most of it is seized. Uh, this doesn't happen to other bookstores. And Isn't it just Canada Customs, though, being consistent? After all, last year they did the same thing, this year they did the same thing, but they did change the rule, and it's a pretty fine line, isn't it, between depiction of some way of uh, uh, protecting society from uh, diseases such as AIDS and uh, then not depicting common homosexual practices. It's a, it's a very difficult thing to define. It, it is, and it's going to be interesting to see how they, again, go through those books and see which ones fall within these new guidelines and what opinions are going to be counting in that. But we, we're, we're pleased with, with them talking finally about AIDS prevention. It's really important in this country, and it's important to our community. But we go beyond that. We're really upset, first of all, that they've attacked our literature some gay literature, some of the best literature in the world. I mean, they have a book by Oscar Wilde in their possession. They have a, a historical book dealing with the persecution of gay men during the Nazi concentration camps. That's our history. They're depriving us of our history. They cannot be allowed to do this. So that brings in the BC Civil Liberties Association. Aren't you fortunate to have their assistance? Yes, we are. This kind of a case is phenomenal in cost. We've pondered it before. There's no way that a small bookstore can fight that sort of thing. And it's real nice to know that there are people out there that will take a cause and they'll see injustice done and they'll deal with it. And we are very pleased, Mr. Dixon, and the BC Civil Liberties. So ultimately, the Supreme Court will determine the social mores in well, this matter. Well, uh, it's conceivable that the deputy minister, the minister of revenue excise, will say, just kidding, and uh, give us all of our books and change the guidelines to conform to our view of what would be appropriate. We're not going to hold our breath on that, but we're good sports, and we're certainly going to exhaust the appellate process made available to us by customs. But I think the case belongs before the courts. And, but uh, how do you deal with the paradox of pro protecting society and the fear of censorship. Well, how do you come down on that? Protect I mean, society from what I How do you protect society from AIDS, from the fear of AIDS, and protect society from the fear of censorship? You, you really have a difficult conundrum. Well, I don't think I do. Um, I don't see how it can be reasonably supposed to be the case that protecting this community, in scare quotes, from books, magazines, videotapes, movies, can have any real connection with the protection of the community from a disease. In fact, I take it, we all understand that our best weapon in combating is AIDS education. is education, yeah. not homophobia. Indeed. Well, I think that you're going to have a, a very long, protracted discussion of this, and you're probably going to be one of the people that are going to be singled out, as in the history of many, many uh, such cases in the past. But your job is to protect all of us, and here you are protecting another group that seems to have been singled out. Do you think the gay community has been singled out in this case? Well, I got a letter from Varda Burston, uh, one of the anti-censorship people active in Toronto a couple of weeks ago, and she told me that uh, the Glad Day bookstore there is nearly in receivership because all of its materials have been seized. I don't want to really speculate about what motives have led customs to crack down on gay bookstores. Uh, I frankly don't care whether they're taking polls or anything else. What I do know is that they're not up on their law. And our people are. Well, and, we'll uh, take some calls from the public, <laughs> uh, your calls to Jim Diva and to John Dixon after the break.
and welcome back. Your calls now to Jim Diva from the Little Sisters Bookshop and for John Dixon. And the first call we're going to take, you're on, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Hello, Iona. Hello. Um, I, I, I think that you've got a little bit of responsibility there as a host today. I mean, I, I'd like to see a little bit of confrontation occur here. With the, You've got two guests that seem to be on the same side of the fence, and you seem to be sitting on the same side. Well, we, we brought the uh, Canada Customs in because I think that they have uh, taken a move in this uh, matter, too. But you're the confronter today. Go ahead. Well, I'd, I'd, li I'd like to just ask uh, what other books were, were are, are being seized. I mean, we, we've had this... Uh, uh, Allen Ginsberg and Oscar Wilde cited as two literary examples of books that have been held uh, by Canada Customs, but what about some of the other disgusting pornography that's held, that's kept to the side, which by its content and by its eroticism promotes younger men and, and gets other people turned on to explore and uh, get excited about uh, sexual exchanges which do not uh, conform, let's say, to... Uh, Community mores. Pardon me? To the community standards that you think exist. Well, that's exactly the yes. point. And mm -hmm. as, as the host of the show and, uh, and as the, uh, the, the Ontario, uh, uh, or sorry, as the uh, uh, ombudsman there. He I have n I've never lived in Ontario full time. I'll start with Jim to re respond and then we'll go to Mr. Dixon too. We <coughs> definitely dwelt on the literary ones because that's the ones that outraged me the most. We have had books seized by customs which do fall within their guidelines which we don't think are obscene, but which they do deem to be obscene. And I think that is a matter for the courts and, and totally for the courts. And, and hopefully some of those books re will be uh, returned. I think they have some real redeemable qualities in our life today. But uh, why I'm emphasizing the literary part of it is to show that they've gone beyond the guidelines. And, and that's why we're here. Yes, and uh, certainly as a feminist, I have seen a great deal of this propaganda that I consider to be anti-woman. And we saw today a seizure of the Nelson Mandela film from South Africa. So, John, what do you have to add to this? Well, uh, you know, I want to confront the caller, if that's what he desires, head on and, and ask him why he thinks it makes any kind of sense to prevent adult citizens of this jurisdiction from having access to descriptions of sex that they want. Whether or not it's his cup of tea, whether or not it disgusts him, seems to me to be quite beside the question in a self-governing democratic jurisdiction. Well, I can answer that very clearly. In the same way that I think uh, Iona and many of the audience would, and most Canadians would be on the same side of the fence of, of, of finding it disgusting to uh, accept pornography showing rape and torture of women. And, uh, but there are certain social standards with, and where you draw the line becomes the question. That's right, and I guess that that's what we've been talking about here is are they going to take this through the court system and redefine the community standard? But I take it that the vast preponderance, as this man probably knows, of the material that was seized by customs in this instance does not contain any scenes of what the, co the criminal code calls violence, cruelty, nor does it contain any scenes or descriptions of sexual acts with children. I don't know if, uh, if this gentleman uh, uh, subscribes to any pornography or goes to any pornographic bookstores or, or, or whatever, but I'll, I'd just like to comment that I uh, enjoy pornography. I've, I've, I've read Eroticism, it, I subscribe perhaps. to different magazines, etc. But I'll have to say that the gay literature and the gay uh, uh, exposés of, uh, of, uh, in the publishing industry are far more disgustingly erotic and far more perverse than anything that's available for uh, heterosexuals. Jim Dia? To, in, in your opinion, they are. Uh, that's right. And the when, exactly when the I point. read and Hustler, I social sir. standards are going to fa finalize what is the normal right. standard. Uh, because m many of us are just getting disgusted about this. Well, wait, I really would like to address that just for a moment. You, you've somehow said that our literature is more disgusting and our erotica is more disgusting. When I read Hustler and I see women bound up and whipped, I get really upset. That's I violence agree. towards women. We do not have in male gay pornography violence towards women. Believe me, we don't have it. It's not an issue. So what disgusts you with our pornography, our, our erotica? The I'd same like type of thing that disgusts me with the types of things you're describing in, in Hustler. Yeah, well, but, but listen, I mean, he, homosexual friends of mine find uh, almost any erotic depiction of women kind of off-putting. They're not into it. But I take it that nobody forces them to buy Playboy. Nobody's forcing <laughs> you or people who have your sexual taste to buy 
homoerotic literature. Oh, come on. There's certain, there's certain social standards, I think, that, that, that everyone is trying to conform to now or, or the society is trying to get to. And it's these types of social standards that we're going to have to find a common... And we're object. getting to the point with satellite communication and other means that we're going to have to be our own censors all the time. Right now, that, that is possible. In fact, my next guest, I, I'm going to ask him about that. I, in the future, we're going to have to be our own censors all the time. Well, thank you for your call. I think I can get one more in. And you're on the air. Go ahead. Yes, I'd just like to say that I support their, their struggle, and I hope that they win so that we'll be able to have uh, free, um, free reading material of whatever you choose, whether it be heterosexual or homosexual. So you agree you have to be your own censor? Mm -hmm. That's right, exactly. Thank you. Thank you for your call. We've got a lot of that support from the heterosexual community, and it's really nice to see that they see the need for it. You're on the air. Uh, Iona? Yes. I'm majoring in French language and literature at the University of British Columbia. I find it immensely disturbing that uh, certain works I may be studying could be considered obscene. I think the first caller that you were dealing with is way off the mark, and I really believe that it's a matter of personal choice if he doesn't want to read, you know, works by Jean Genet or Oscar Wilde, then he doesn't have to go into Little Sisters bookstore. But that's, that's the question, isn't it? The by first the caller has the right to make those choices, and we should not condemn him for any choices he makes. I think he's trying to impose his will or his particular view to, uh, as he said, to make everyone conform. And I think it's uh, attitudes of those sort of people. Well, thank you. If, if I could just add one... Account, uh, Ind oh. individuals. Thank you. John Dixon has a comment. If I could just add one lawyerly note, I mean, it, it's often the case that people think that community standards means community standards of taste. That is not the standard used by our courts. It's the Canadian community standard of tolerance. It's not what you have a taste for sexually, it's what you will tolerate other adults having access to. There's an enormous distinction. Well, I wish we had more time to discuss this, and I thank you for your call. We'll be back after the break, and we're going to take a look at ceramic homes, and we're going to talk about that future and see whether or not we are going to be our own censors. Thank you both for being on Thank the you, show. Arnie. Thank you very much. <laughs> And here we are with Dr. Tomorrow, Frank Ogden. I have wanted to meet you for so long, having read about you in the Futurists and World Future columns and so on. The most exciting thing, I think, is that you stu still hold a record for 20 years of flights straight up. Are well, you still going? Oh, yes. <laughs> it, it was, it's closer to 30 years now. But, uh, really? Yeah. How far did you go straight uh, up? 19,400. So you feet, are yeah. a flight engineer? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's how you began? In the Air Force, yes. But off the top, I'd like to ask you about our previous guests uh, and the problem of pornography in an open skies world. Well, that's old-fashioned. Technology unmakes the laws today. Politicians make them, but they never unmake them. Technology is unmaking them. I can watch uh, from my houseboat all kinds of pornography off the satellite, and I think that uh, I wonder why uh, um, legal defense staff in many of these cases hasn't used that as an example of discrimination because here somebody that wants to rent a videotape for five bucks they can be arrested depending on what's on the tape but the person that can afford a satellite dish which today is you know they're down to a thousand bucks for the whole system they can watch whatever they want off the satellite so here we have uh, discrimination brought about by technology that is just smashing up a law made in the past. And that's not the only the only thing. You will see, you know about uh, ships' registries of convenience, where ships are registered in Panama or Liberia. You will see satellites of convenience, where they will broadcast anything for a price. Now, you don't have to look at that. Anything but that it sells. Isn't. Anything that sells. That's really and where that's we not come only down to in the end. Sex, even, is uh, going to be different. Uh, there's a company, Anticipatory Sciences, in Minneapolis that are saying that within five short years, some people will be marrying robots that in some cases, many may consider them better than the present variety well, of spice. Well, tell us about Nabu, your, your great well, friend. Well, my, he, he sort of, uh, um, n his, he's been neutered. <laughs> <laughs> Nabu, I hear he dances the tango. Though. Oh, he dances the tango, yes, and he's very uh, good at being a night watchman. But uh, see, remember these uh, robots, there's all kinds of advantages to uh, being married to a robot. Uh, you can uh, design them to your fantasy and program them to your stamina. Oh, good Lord. 
I must say, Frank, there are some, you're also the man who says there's going to be a new Victorianism in the new century. Uh, for some people, uh, there will be some people that just can't stand this rapid pace. Uh, there's indications of this coming up already. Uh, suicide rates have been going up since 1979. Some people just can't stand the accelerated pace. And I see a, an increase in the monastic order, that these people that uh, just can't take it or don't want to exist in this fast-paced world, they will withdraw to mo uh, a monastery, and you'll see a growth in monastic orders. It'll also help with paying the mortgage and looking after your uh, food needs and so oh, yes. you can work for your uh, And this is happening sustenance. right out here in Mission. A few years ago, one or two years ago, they had trouble getting new uh, priests. Now I think this year they got 17. Well, the price of homes being what it is, that uh, sounds like a reasonable alternative. It is. Well, let's talk about the ceramic homes that you uh, have seen. Well, uh, yeah, I first uh, was watching a satellite uh, program and saw a little clip on the um, uh, these ceramic homes, and uh, I went over to uh, Japan, and I, everywhere I go now, I take a video cameraman because well, let's so take a look at it. Yeah. Well, the world has been constructing our homes much along the same lines for thousands of years. But in Japan, a severe shortage of natural resources and land upon which to build have caused them to reconsider home building and design. The Misawa Corporation is the largest home builder in the world, with 340,000 built the old way. Today, Misawa is creating living environments of the future. They construct all their homes with nine-foot ceilings in their living rooms. As their research has shown that such homes have a lower incidence of juvenile delinquency. But the real technological advance here is in the fact that these homes are made in just 40 minutes and fully erected in just two hours. These homes are fireproof, rotproof, have an amazingly high insulation factor and come completely furnished. Furthermore, their basic building materials are silicon and limestone, two of the most common elements on our planet. And how much do they cost? Uh, in Japan, they're $100,000 for a three-bedroom, two-bathroom. Now, that is not the land. You lease the land in, in Japan. And, and it's I'd fully say furnished? Fully furnished and uh, very elaborately furnished as far as the appliances go. And why is it that there's less uh, juvenile delinquency in such homes? Well, as it's been explained to me, uh, there's not the uh, confinement feeling and the frustration. With higher ceilings, uh, there's more a feeling of uh, space. Ah. Well, tell us about the, the studies that led you to be able to look into the future the way you do. Uh, were you educated in a traditional way? Oh, no. I have absolutely no academic qualifications. That's probably what made you able to oh, see the is. future. Oh, it is. I feel that I was very fortunate to uh, escape the brain-damaging effect of going through the traditional educational system. What's wrong with the educational system? Where is it going to be in You don't have years? enough time. If I was here for a month, to tell you what's the matter with <laughs> okay. the educational system. What's it going to be like in 25 years from now? Will schools still exist? Uh, certainly not in the present uh, state. I think that uh, you're going to see a lot more of education uh, electronically via satellite and fiber optic cable. It's already happening now. We have educational channels. You can now get a university degree in BC without getting out of bed. And Japan is privatizing universities? The next 15 universities that are being built in Japan are all privatized because the companies found out they were paying taxes f to send kids to school, and when they came out of the school, they weren't adequate to for what they wanted them for, so they're starting their own universities, and they're training them. First of all, they're training them in science and technology and globalization. When you're a graduate of this school, from any of these new universities, you'll be able to go into any one of 174 countries and get a job, and they're guaranteeing jobs. When I was a kid, if you wanted a good education, they sent you to Germany because that was the science base of the day, and if you wanted a, med a medical degree. And then as the humanities took over, you went to uh, Oxford or Cambridge, and then Harvard, Princeton, or Yale. You will see within a very short number of years, like two, that people here, affluent people, will be sending their offspring to Tokyo, Nagoya, and Osaka for an education because that's where the edu you can get lear today's the, learning. The, the second language will be Japanese. Well, languages are on the way out. Uh, we have a clip uh, oh, coming up. Oh, one of the translators. Yes. yes it, we'll, we'll take a look at that, at that in a little while. But I was interested also in uh, the fact that uh, you had also foreseen a time when there would be dolphins acting as midwives. Oh, well, that's, uh, yeah, I said that, I don't know, 10, 
some years ago. We can't even get women to act as oh, I know. Well, now. this is being done right now in uh, on the Balt the uh, Black Sea by a doctor, Igor Sherkovsky, and he's been uh, delivering uh, children uh, birthing underwater for 20 years now. He's delivered thousands. What's better about it? Well, first of all, they don't get the shock of gravity. They're going from one saline solution into another saline solution, so they come weight, uh, weightless into the the world. And what they're, he's doing, they keep the umbilical cord attached to the child for a minute or two, and he's trying to stretch that. And the baby is just in a bigger womb, and he's swimming attached to the mother's umbilical cord. As then, a brand new child. Right. Womb. And then they bring him out gradually, and then they sever the cord. And these kids are now swimming two kilometers when they're six uh, months old. And what do the dolphins do? Oh, well, the dolphins are now, the latest is the dolphins are acting as midwives. How? Well... Remember, they know more about the child than the mother because when the mother's first pregnant, she goes into the water and the dolphins are there and they're communicating with the child via sonar. Now, they've been using that for 25 million years, so they're getting pretty good at it, whereas we've been just, you know, getting introduced to sonar. So with that sonar wave, the um, dolphin can see the baby develop and then when it comes out, he's already known it for nine months. So, so what's the baby will be more comfortable. Right, and they more? hold them up with their flippers, and they've got them now. They've taught them how to swim. And uh, guess who it's being bankrolled by? Uh, the Russian, Campers? No, the <laughs> Russian Sports uh, fa Federation. Oh, yes. And when they enter them in the Olympics, scratch everybody I'm else. I'm surprised it's not East Germany. They're the most famous for their swimmers. Yeah, well, even they're going to be left behind. Of course, behind. they have genetic uh, banks. They, know, they mm -hmm. know the history of all of their, uh, their athletes. Right. Well, we're going to come back after the break, and we're going to let the people uh, call you and uh, ask you about the future. Okay. I'll be back in just a few minutes. <laughs> Uh, the robot supermarket, and we'll talk over top of it because there's no sound on it. I'll bring it up in this section somewhere. I'm not quite sure when. Do you want to do the translator? Uh, the statement? translator comes last, and I may not do it at all. We can, we can do it in different orders. You don't have to stick to that order. Well, uh, it was mentioned already. That's okay, well, I'd, I'd like to do the robot brain then next and leave the other two yes. out. Robot brain, because he brought it up, and I didn't think it was queued up, so I didn't call for it. Okay. That's why I skipped over it. The brain first? Yeah. And then the supermarket? No, I'll we'll do the brain and forget about it till the next break. Okay. Good thing this time. Dr. Tomorrow is here today. Frank Ogden, you were talking a moment ago about the robot brain. And you know, I have been reading some of this in the Futurist magazines. It seems that the, the actual intelligence of these computerized brains is getting far ahead of their creators. What happens? Well, this is occurring. Uh, as we're developing uh, our uh, artificial intelligence to such a degree, um, in some cases we don't know what is happening uh, because the, uh, for instance, this clip that we'll shortly be showing, um, and this is uh, from Oxford, a branch of Oxford, and uh, they're putting so much into this computer brain that they don't know how it is uh, handling it because it's doing it in random, just like the human brain is. But it reminds you of a science fiction story of some computer gone mad, a HAL, uh, uh, who might, in fact, cause damage to the world. Yeah, but also, you know, that's the North American view. Um, a robot can also do a lot of good for the world. You know, mutations aren't always bad. Well, let's have a look at it. Randomly wired, like the human brain, Wizard also learns for itself what are the important elements of an image and stores that information. It's built of silicon like a computer, but it operates more like the human brain. Because its operation is random, not even the scientists who built it are quite sure what it's doing. But it possesses the subtlety of the human mind. Confronted with a human face, it can recognize and discriminate. A face smiling or a face frowning. Wizard can see the difference and still know it's looking at the same face. Frank, we have, we have the technology. Do we have the intelligence to control it? Well, that's just like uh, the same thing happened when they invented the axe. 
Uh, we had the intelligence to use it for uh, chopping wood and making fire and keeping ourselves warm. But some people used it to chop up people and that wasn't nice. So it, you know, this is going to happen. There will be cases when uh, uh, computers and uh, robots are used uh, against man. Um, and, um, you know, that will happen. But I think we will, uh, in the overall, benefit from it. Your questions to Frank Ogden. Go ahead, please. Hello there, Mr. Ogden. You were talking about home construction techniques. Can you tell us a little bit about the vessel you live aboard currently? Your well, houseboat. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, yes, I live uh, aboard a, um, a houseboat. It's uh, made of a fiberglass uh, sandwich. It's uh, fiberglass on the exterior and the interior, and it has three inches of polyurethane foam. Uh, all the windows are uh, optical plexiglass, which has three times the insulating qualities of normal window pane, and consequently it costs me a fraction to heat my house that it costs you to heat yours. It has high vaulted ceilings, 16-foot uh, ceilings as well, and there's no feeling of uh, confinement like there is in a small apartment, even though my square footage is only 850 square feet. And uh, it has... Uh, a spiral stay staircase and a Japanese bath and uh, balconies and all the toys and uh, does Neville three do robots. Does the house cleaning? Uh, not th the house cleaning, although he does uh, answer the phone and can change video cassettes and Thank you for your night call. Watchman. Well, moving on, you're on the air. Go ahead. Yes, hello. Hello. How are you? Fine. I was um, the doctor there. With the communications in, in the world today, we're already well into fiber optics and. Uh, digital systems, satellite relay systems, uh, Canadian, uh, the, the cellular telephones. What do they see for that in the future? Cellular telephones are old fashioned. There's some, the Japanese have something way beyond that already. It's called the personal radio communication system and it's a combination of cellular, uh, citizens band, uh, walkie talkies. And with a system of relay stations that are owned by entrepreneurs and not by phone companies, you can relay your phone and uh, can converse with anybody within roughly 100 miles. And then if you want to make a phone sys call through the regular system, you can do that. But I think you're going to see uh, phone monopolies uh, uh, vanish because um, uh, their costs are continually going up because they're using old-style systems, the copper wire, the fiber optics. Another company could come in and wire Vancouver, and their phone rates, I suggest, wouldn't increase. Well, there are so many of the uh, occupations we now know that are going to disappear. What are people going to do, Frank? Well, they're going to do something else. At one time, 98% of the population of North America were farmers. Today, we know that it's less than 2%. And consequently, what did happen to that 96%? They did something different. We now know that where manufacturing used to be 60% of the population, it's, we now know it will never need more than 15%. And once we fully robotize, we're lucky if we're going to use 5%. Thank you They're for your They're going call. to do something different. What's, what's the future for Vancouver? It's executive city. Are all the service people going to live up the valley like Sawito? Well, um, I think uh, we're in for uh, a turbulent decade in uh, Vancouver and British Columbia because we've got lived too long uh, on the fat of the land and the uh, industries such as uh, mining, lumber, and fishing, they're finished. We just saw the ceramic homes. Can you imagine when that comes here? It's a far better house than anything else around here. Uh, we've, so uh, we don't have to worry about the pre The Japanese on, on have wood. just uh, successfully bred the king salmon in captivity. Within three years, you will see salmon grown in Japan, selling here better quality and cheaper than our salmon caught Spring in our waters. Spring salmon sashimi from Japan. Yes. Uh, we're going to go up to 100 Mile House. You're on the air. Hello? Go ahead. Hi, Iona. Good Hi. job. I think you're doing much better than the curmudgeonly Jack. Oh, he'll be back on Monday. You better not say that. Okay. Well, anyway, this is in regard to the ceramic homes. I have laying here in front of me a copy of the Whole Earth Catalog from 15 years ago. And it has an article in it about uh, building with molasses. Now, it, what you do with it is it, there's a, it's like a, not actually molasses by the time it gets made into a home. It's more like a plastic made with cement. You, um, apparently, you take um, um, blackstrap molasses and it's dried into a powder and several different polymers are added. These people, uh, well, they mentioned it's very cheap. The, the prices are 15 years old here. They said they um, completed a new surface on the outside of a building in the same manner as uh, 
aluminum siding for approximately $25. Sounds then like a glorified ginger snap to me. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm aware of that. There's several systems. Another good one is where they make it out of chicken wire and put it in the ocean, and coral forms a shell around it, and then they take it out. So and you have a have coral house? Yes. Thank you for your call. That's very interesting. <laughs> We're going to move along now. You're on the air. Go ahead. Good afternoon. I have two items I'd just like to touch on quickly uh, with Mr. Ogden. Uh, the first one, uh, you seem to be quite impressed with the Japanese going to their uh, universities uh, privatized, but you neglect that General Motors Institute in the U.S., and the Control Data Institute already started that, and our answer to it already is co-op education systems. Witness uh, University of Waterloo is the first one in Canada, and similar ones. The other one is, I think, I get the impression that people are really mesmerized and almost regarded as high priestish uh, when it comes to computers. Um, I find a lot of the stuff that's put out on artificial intelligence is either complete out-and-out -out bunk, or it's, it's really hyped and it's put in the wrong context. I say that with 15 years' experience in the field, and I really find that you're misleading people. For example, even that clip, heck, the computer you use at home, you don't know what it's doing internally. No person can tell you really. You have a vague idea of what's happening, but you still don't know what it's doing. I, I find you. that you're taking a lot of little items, putting them out of context, and hyping it. Dr. Ogden? Well, we only have a few uh, moments on a show like this, but uh, I'm certainly aware of what uh, General Motors and several of the other large corporations are doing. Uh, but they have uh, started their own universities, in effect, for the same reason, that the present educational system was not capable of producing the type of graduates that they required. If I in may, I'm just saying that they were doing this well before the Japanese were doing it. For the General Motors Institute, that's back into the 1960s. Well, Americans were making automobiles well before the Japanese, too. But if you check automobiles today, the best quality is coming from Japan. They have learned from the check, teacher. If you, check, sir, you're, if you check, the designs that are being used in Japan originated in California. But while we were arguing about whether or not there was artificial intelligence, they moved to a fifth and sixth generation there's no, computers. There's no robotics available today. It's simply sophisticated machinery. It doesn't fall into the classification of robotics and even artificial intelligence. It's the expert systems, as they're quoted as being, that exist today are simply very, uh, well, they're sophisticated programming, if, if you know what the programming structure's like, but they're not, they're nothing amazing or approaching intelligence. That's Sounds to me like it's the old garbage in, garbage out cliche that you're putting forward exactly. to us here. Well, even, even in the hype of it, that's exactly what it is. Well, of course, I feel that uh, this is just the first rustic stages of this, and just like an automobile or an airplane, you know, for many years they didn't fly because they just weren't good enough. But then finally, uh, they perfected the first one, and now look at, uh, you know, the mm. Concorde, for example. And I say that Same. artificial intelligence uh, is alive. It may be just uh, being born, but uh, stick around and... Uh, oh, I'm planning to for a few hundred years if I can. Well, we'll see. Uh, yeah. How long do you intend to stick around, Frank? Oh, Thank quite you. a while. Thank you. We're going to move on. Go ahead. You're on the air. Hello there. Hello. Uh, a very interesting show. Now, you said something earlier about um, uh, how the education system in BC is, uh, or in anywhere in the world, really is, is lousy and, and public schools aren't living up to what they're supposed to be. Now, I was discussing this with my wife, and I think that it would be better if we kept my son out of school and were to teach him at home and, uh, you know, uh, use a computer or, or keep, and teach him at home and teach all my children at home. I think that. Uh, he would get a better education that way, better than he would learn in school. And what do you think about this, doctor? I agree with you. I think that uh, they can get a far better education. And not only that, it won't be a traditional education. Because you get a traditional education, you have traditional answers. And those answers were OK in the industrial age. They are not satisfactory in the communication Frank age. Frank Ogden agrees, so he's going to be around to check on your children. So we'll be back again after the break. I'm still going to school at home. <laughs> It's not catching. Yeah, uh, Pat just wants to know what BTRs you want. To uh, I might go to the the Swahili uh, translator, uh, but I don't know for sure. <laughs> so queue it up, and, and if I call for it, I'm not going to go to the uh, supermarket thing. Hmm? I'm going to ask you about women, because uh, oh, yeah. this is what I always say that uh, society has always given men these attributes and women these attributes, and yeah. the best people have both. Translator has uh, 15 seconds of voiceover. 
And it goes to sound on tape, and, we'll and it jump comes on back it. to voiceover. Oh, good. So too, too fancy. So no, it. I'll, give you, I'll give you the count. Oh, all right. I'll be right here. If we right call right. for it. I may not call for it. Okay. Because it's too yeah. complicated. Yeah, answer me the women thing. Yeah. I really yeah. feel that they have... If Tupac calls it on his funeral, it's so successful, and nobody can understand. Back again on the subject of tomorrow, something I wanted to ask you about, and that's what's the future for women in this society that you foresee? We're in a terrible state of turbulence now. We're losing ground, as a matter of fact. But what's the long term for our sex? I think it's a far better future for a woman than for a man. Why? Uh, because uh, in the past, man uh, based their uh, influence and affluence was uh, achieved because of their uh, education and their experience. And until fairly recently, women didn't have an opportunity to get that education, even though that, I think, is passed now. And the women can, uh, they have attributes that a man doesn't have. And uh, for instance, they have a th uh, intuition. And in the future, things, information is coming so fast in such volumes from so many different directions that you can't have time to, uh, the luxury of taking a long time to digest it and then make a decision. You base your decision on uh, your perception of the moment, the latest change in your intuition. And women are far better than that in men. And also, they have a thing called synchronicity, where they can do many things at one time. And a man, men aren't capable of doing that, like but running a house, doing else? the cooking. Five things come to a boil on the stove at the same time. They're talking to their girlfriend, the dog, and the telling kids. their kids what's <laughs> happening, and their husband sitting in front of the TV watching their show with a beer. Of course, we know why that happened, because when they were living in the cave, if they hadn't had that sixth sense, their babies wouldn't have been alive long, That's and neither right. would yes. they. Well, you also said that governments were coming to an end. Maybe the dream of all people, politicians, will finish. Let's go and see what they have to say in Kamloops. Come on, you're on the air. Yeah, all I wanted to do was ask, uh, what do you think of the present political system and how long it's going to last? Uh, seeing as how everything's so computerized nowadays, the political system seems kind of slow. I think governments are uh, becoming irrelevant. Technology both unmakes the laws and makes the laws today. Uh, we have laws against gambling, we have laws against banking and cross-border data flow. Yet I can use my phone jumper, I go into the U.S. wholesale phone network, I can bet at five racetracks in the United States using my Visa card, and I can watch it off my satellite dish. And so what those laws are, they're still on the books and occasionally they enforce them, but they don't bother me because, remember, in the new age, the electrons travel at 180,000 uh, miles a second, the speed of light, and you know how slow governments are. Yes, well, they're not going to work, and they didn't ever really work all that well but the system was a little slower to take it into time. Let's move on. Thank you for your call. We're going to go here. You're on the air. I saw in a particular article, I think it was Omni, and they claim 21-year-olds today will um, live to an age of 200. How far do you think the average lifespan of people will move into the future? Well, the lifespan uh, for the average North American male uh, since the year 1900, this century, has gone up 50 percent. Uh, but uh, what has really gone up is their time in retirement. Uh, it used to be that people only spent, um, uh, you know, a couple of years bef after they retired and they were dead. But now that has increased 1,100 percent. Because and we're much fitter. That's fitter, and they're living longer. And so your retirement age uh, eventually may be longer than your working life. What do you think the maximum lifespan for human beings is? I don't think we know, but I, I think it's unlimited because as we get more and more knowledge and we learn how to uh, replace more and more parts, uh, you can uh, just be built. In fact, I think uh, we've, uh, we're at an evolutionary, not a revolutionary stage in our life. And I think that we're going to branch off. In the past, for millions of years, we've been uh, all evolving along a carbon-dated organic system. I think you're going to see the marriage of the organic and the inorganic. And we may evolve as bionic people. In fact, it is now possible. They've just... Uh, put a neural cell, a human brain neural cell, and uh, attached it, bonded it, to a Motorola 68,000 microprocessor. What if does it do? If we attach that to a fertilized human egg, we can have a child that's bi bionic from birth already. And somebody, somewhere, is doing it now, And you've I'm also sure. prognosticated that there will be robots operating on human beings, replacing parts. They're doing it now. They're doing it now. They have uh, the robot nurses in Japan, and they have robots doing brain surgery, and they're far superior to any human. And we'll be on assembly lines, and we'll be all wrapped in electrodes, and there'll be no human care. 
Oh, no. Do you know what? I, uh, both at the robot supermarket and where they're using the robot nurses, I asked them, why do you do this? Why do you like this? And do you know what they said? Both in the supermarkets that was all robotized and in the, where they had robot nurses, they said where the robots are, it's more humane. Oh, my Lord. Now you are really scaring me. I'm oh, going to move to another call. You're on the air. Hi, thanks very much. Um, I have a real problem with this sort of popular mechanics view of the future, um, and that is this question that you talked about earlier, Ione, about technological change and displacement of human beings. Yes. Because I think one of the problems is much of this new technology is being created for, for one reason, and that is increased profits. Um, what the companies, well, what happens to people who are unemployed um, is not a concern of the companies. We see it today uh, when there, are, there seem to be two new classes of workers, the very skilled, technologically literate class, which is a very small number, and a much larger uh, class that has been de-skilled. Uh, they are people whose skills and their jobs have been taken away from them. Uh, one famous example is that of McDonald's, um, with the cash registers, and some of the ones don't even have prices on them. They have pictures of the items. So you don't even have to be able to add in order to make the change. All you have to be able to do is to identify a $20 bill, and you can work at McDonald's. That, to me, does not seem to do much to enhance the quality of lives of most of the people who will be working for a living can't afford the uh, robots, the wonderful toys and tools that Mr. Ogden has. But I think this is probably where some of uh, Frank Ogden's philosophy should come in and we haven't had time to deal with today. For instance, your nine points for dealing with the future, which really is an educational flexibility so that people can find ways of surviving in the new world. Would you like to go through them for this uh, listener? Well, uh, I believe that you've got to be open to change. Obviously, if you uh, ignore the technology, if you run away from it and hide from it, quite likely you'll be victimized by it. But if you embrace it, try to understand it and work with it, quite likely you'll profit by it. That's your individual decision. And everybody, you know, I respect your right to remain ignorant. And if you want to go on like that, you know, you have that choice. Well, I, I do want to say that I do use a computer. Um, I am not, um, in fact, a de-skilled worker. What I'm saying is that the, the decisions that are being made um, are not being made by every individual who, like yourself, has a, a certain amount of money and the flexibility and the training, uh, the abilities, the networks to be able to do this. In fact, we do live in a, in a class society, and lots of people are simply denied this. It's not in the interest, say, of General Motors to... Um, to train all their people to be engineers. They need lots of people that will do the work that maybe will be done by robots, but in the meantime, these people will simply be out of work, well, out of jobs. Thank you for your observation, because Frank Ogden is self-taught, and he makes his money by interpreting for the very governments and so on that are making the decisions. Yeah, I think uh, you're definitely wrong. I think there's more opportunity out there today. There's, uh, there's greater uh, opportunities for everyone, but they have to get rid of their industrial age eyes and put on new glasses and see the golden nuggets of opportunity in the new age that are laying around. But if you're looking with industrial eyes, you don't see anything. Because most of the things in the future and coming up now, the valid things of importance are all invisible. Thank you for your call. You sound like you've already got a new pair of eyes there. Uh, you know, you're, you're really uh, causing everyone to expand their thoughts about tomorrow. So many people have feared tomorrow. And uh, we've been in a backwater now for, what, 10, 15 mm -hmm. years. We've been wallowing in nostalgia because we're afraid to look at tomorrow. When are we going to have the courage to look at tomorrow? Well, uh, uh, there's quite a few people uh, right here in Vancouver and in British Columbia that are doing that. They just said the old way isn't working, for me at least. And so they have started out uh, new things. There's all kinds of things happening here. Ahoy Industrial, the first guy to use robots here. He couldn't sell his products in the States uh, before he had robots because they weren't in of sufficient quality. Now he sells them in the States at the same price he used to sell them in Canada, but he's selling them in American dollars, and now it's a profitable com company. Well, we've got another call. Go, you're on the air. Uh, good evening to the both of you. Hello. Hello. Just one question, uh, Mr. Ogden. Do you have any books uh, that you've published on the subjects you've been talking about? No, I believe print's old-fashioned, too. Uh, you know... Uh, well, not everyone owns a computer. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, then I suggest uh, you, can, you should get one. Do you realize how cheap you can get computers these days? You can rent them if you don't want to uh, 
uh, purchase one. And uh, what I was suggesting a year ago, but I think they're all sold out now, the Sinclair Timex was selling for 30 bucks, and you hooked it up to your television set, and it was a good computer. It wasn't any big masterpiece, but you would learn from that. And then you can Kleenex it and throw it away and get one that uh, is more in keeping with what you want to do after you learn what a computer can do. There are a few articles written about Frank Ogden, and he used to have a PBS television show called The Bizarre World of Dr. Tomorrow. How still. about more of that? Well, that's still going. Yeah. It's still going? Yeah, that's... Well, well, when that. is it on so that this uh, viewer can well, see the, it? Uh, uh, well, the one series, uh, Cultures of the Pacific Rim, uh, that's running in America now. Uh, the, fir the segment on that called uh, High Tech, High Touch Japan, we had a couple of clips from that. And the uh, Bizarre World will be running, and uh, oh, I'm sure the Knowledge Network, TV Ontario. And if he has a computer, can he patch into you and get the information? What he can do. Uh, my uh, column is going worldwide electronically uh, via the latest thing, which is the National Information and Educational Utility out of Vienna, Virginia. Well, we have to break. We've come to the end of the show. Well, okay, Once again, sorry. technology intervenes. Thank you very much, Frank, right, and I'll you. be back after the break. We'll wind up this year tomorrow with three eminent economists telling us where our province is going to go in 1987. In addition to that, we're going to be asking for your calls and wishes for the world and the next uh, year coming. That's on The Webster Show tomorrow at 5 p.m. precisely.